thought the first thing I should do is really just um, say who I am and, and what I've been doing. Um, but I've been doing professional services now for the last 28 years. So if you want to talk about product, don't come and talk to me that much. I'm, I'm a little bit alright on product, but, but predominantly what I do is professional services. Um, I'm president of what used to be called the Council of Registered Ethical Security Testers, which is CREST. Um, since we originally had that title, we've actually extended our remit to cover intrusion analysis, malware reverse engineering, security architecture, uh, and a number of other things like cyber security incident response. So there's a whole pile of different aspects uh, that we're associated with in terms of uh, providing that sort of professional level service. Um, I was also chairman of something called the Class Forum. Uh, I established the Class Forum. That was a CESG listed security advisor scheme. Um, that's the scheme within central government uh, where you have to um, belong to it uh, to provide certain types of IA related consultancy services. Um, the reason why I put that up there is because there's quite a few changes going on in the class scheme right now and what I wanted to do is just describe some of the opportunities and the career things you, you might have if, if you move in that sort of direction. Um, I was a fellow of the, BC, uh, of the BCI, uh, which is the Business Continuity Planning Institute, and again the only reason I put that up there is because I really think that in that particular area uh, we've really got to step up in terms of our performance. Um, if you look at that particular industry, it's still very much related to fire, water damage, natural disaster. Uh, yet, for example, I'm working with the Bank of England and the FSA in terms of looking at the cyber incident response across the city of London for the banking community. That's really where that particular institution should be looking, and I don't think really they've stepped up their game. So I think it's our responsibility in the technical arena to try to drive people in those sorts of directions. Um, I'm working on a number of initiatives within government uh, to define the future direction of security schemes. And by those I mean things like uh, CHECK, which is the government approved um, system for doing penetration testing work, for CLASS, which again is the government approved system for doing those uh, aspects of more general security consultancy. Uh, but there's also a number of other initiatives going on that we're trying to tie together. So one I'd like to bring your attention to right now is that I'm working with um, IAC and BIS, which is the Information Assurance Advisory Council, and we're pulling together a number of CVs for summer internships. So if you want or you know somebody who wants a summer internship, get me their CV really quickly and I might be able to drop it into that program, and that's a really good thing. I'm also working with people like eSkills in terms of development pathways, trying to take people out of university and then putting them on a career path or a development path into the profession. The qualifications and things that I'm responsible for come in at around about six to six and a half thousand hours worth of relevant and frequent experience. So in other words, what we've got to do is try and bridge the gap between your university experience and what you need to do to actually enter the profession. Um, I'm also the founding partner of something called Insight Consulting. Um, I took that from a startup organisation to around about 130 full time uh, information security professionals. Uh, that also included a training organisation and a recruitment company. I sold that to Siemens and I sat on the board of Siemens um, Communications for EMA for, for about five years. So, the other thing that I offer is if anybody's interested in, in talking about their career opportunities or they're interested in talking to me about how to set up and how to grow a professional services firm, I will always talk to you. you know, I'm, I'm completely open and it's one of the roles that I think as Crest we should do. And also I can give you a balanced view about the type of organisation we think that you should be aiming for. So in other words, if you want to talk to me about going to the Big Four, I do a lot of work with the Big Four. If you want to talk about going into a communications type environment, then I can talk about those. And again, if you want to go into a boutique, I can talk about those sorts of things as well. So I'm really hoping that this is an opening in terms of a dialogue with you. This isn't the first time I hope it is the first time, but I hope it's not going to be the last time uh, that we have communications. This is really opening the door, trying to show you that the profession is really interested in you coming on board, and then we'll do whatever we can in terms of providing support for you in terms of your early and then developing career. Um, in addition to that, I'm also responsible for this as well. I'm part of the project team to build the next land speed record car. Uh, it's called Bloodhound SSC, so it's Bloodhound Supersonic Car. Um, it's a 1,050 mile an hour car. We have an EJ200 Eurofighter engine, an 18 inch hybrid rocket, and, uh, and it's powered, the, the rocket itself is um, fueled by a, a Cosworth Formula One engine, uh, around about 770 brake horsepower. Um, just to give you an idea, this is the um, first firing of the 18-inch rocket in the UK. Uh, this is a full-size aircraft hangar. And um, just to give you an idea of what a rocket at around about 20% um, looks like. That's the Cosworth engine firing up in the background, just to give you an idea. I had the Cosworth people standing next to me when we did this in a, another hardened bunker, which was about 50 metres away, and they asked me to turn the speakers up. We didn't have any speakers on. A 
and that's just a rocket at 20 percent so if you imagine an ej 200 eurofighter engine out of a typhoon tied to the back of it as well as a cosworth formula one engine this thing will be really worth coming to see so and the reason for doing that and, and the reason for showing it is what we're trying to do is to encourage more youth into science technology engineering and maths Obviously, when I have the videos and things of the Bloodhound car, it's very easy for me to just prove how sexy uh, engineering is. Um, what we need to do is do the same thing for IT and the same thing for IA. So what I'm doing is looking at initiatives where we can have the same sort of impact in schools and colleges to try and encourage more youth into information technology and then ultimately into information assurance and IT security. Coming back to the more mundane aspects but I think equally as exciting. Um, this is Crest. There is four elements to what we try to provide. We first of all have a company membership and what we're trying to do there is the buying community want to buy these sorts of penetration testing and intrusion analysis services from trusted organisations and they want to do it with skilled and knowledge one competent people. So that first element is the company membership. And what we're looking for there is a demonstrable level of the policies, processes and procedures that that company has in place to actually operate in this, type, in this type of area. We have a different application form for penetration testing and intrusion analysis and then we're developing one as well for security architecture. The really important thing about that is that ties into the codes of conduct. So we have a code of conduct associated with the organisation that we tie itself to. If we really want to be a profession, we have to look like other professional organisations. And that's really one of the first things. We currently have 38 members in the UK, 38 member companies. We've probably got about another 14 that would like to join right now, of which I think about two will make it. Um, we have a very high bar in terms of the organisations. We're a not-for-profit organisation, the bit at the bottom there. I prefer not-for-loss, but not-for-profit is good enough. Um, and therefore, we don't need to lower the bar. It's an extremely difficult to get thing to get in, and the companies that are members are really of the highest calibre. We have currently nine organisations in Australia. There will be 13 in the next three months. Uh, we've got three in South Africa. I've got two in India. I've got one in uh, Greece and I've got one that's just moving forward in Slovenia. So we're gradually also extending our international remit because there aren't very many organisations like ours uh, serving the international population. In addition to that, the buying community really want to buy consistent services across a range of international borders because they tend to be financial services, farms, shoes call, retail, uh, that operate in different regions. We then tie that together with the professional qualifications and we look at that in terms of validation of the competence of the information security specialists. As I say, our qualifications start at around about 6,000 hours, uh, around about two to two and a half years worth of experience. If you're only doing it half time, it's going to take you five years. Uh, and then the, the higher level qualifications come in at around about 10,000 hours, so five, five years worth of relevant and frequent experience. Um, we also revalidate every three years and certainly for senior people that's quite a problem because if you're really good you'll be given a team to manage and then three years later you've got to try and take a technical examination. It's really difficult to do. So again we're looking at that top level in terms of how we're going to identify and retain that sort of talent in, in the industry. In addition to that we've got knowledge sharing over there. Um, and that's really part of what we're doing here. We want to share information and we're trying to do that more in a more structured way through the university system. So we have something we've called uh, the Crest Information Exchange, CrestX, and what we're going to do is to make all of our presentations that we have at our conferences available to the student population. And what we're asking them to then do is to provide some input back. So in other words, they can use that material for their own internal conferences, and then we ask them to do presentations and put that back into the centre. We have a number of other information exchanges being set up. I've got research programs in cyber incident response, penetration testing, I've just started some work on SCADA, and, and again we're sponsoring a lot of information sharing type research activity. Um, what I'm hoping to do as well is to build white papers and have closer links with academia. And then the final part down there is the professional development and therefore what we're trying to do is to encourage the very best people into our industry and make sure we retain them through a proper career structure and then also look at the ongoing professional development opportunities again through workshops, through development activities, through our conferences and through our information exchanges. So those are the four elements in terms of what we do and we don't do anything else that sits outside of there. Our vision therefore is to represent the technical information security industry um, and again I think we've really come from a backwater. If you take penetration testers for example, I think we had a fairly bad um, um, 
impression in the marketplace in terms of what we did in this particular area but now we have professional level qualifications we have codes of conduct for the individuals and for the companies we have proper audits of the individuals professions and we have proper audits of the companies we tie all those things together with proper knowledge base and information exchanges and then we put a career structure in place we are looking more like a profession than a lot of other parts of the IT, IT industry or it, it's not IT security so we're doing our very best to try to represent you and, and anything you can do to help us, you know, we're really open to, to receiving. We haven't been established that long, it's, it's now about eight years and I'd say around about six of those years we've been operational, so it's so a couple to, to put the whole thing in place. But now I think we probably represent about 80 to 85 percent of the UK penetration testing market. Uh, we've probably got around about 40 percent of the intrusion analysis and cyber incident response market, but that will increase very quickly, very soon, and then we'll start to build that up with security architecture. All of our qualifications are accredited by the UK government and form part of their information security schemes. Um, in other words, for some of the technical areas, you have to pass our examinations to work in those sorts of areas. And again, if you look in the financial services area, it's really a de facto standard. I don't ever want it to be an actual standard because at that point I don't think you work quite as hard, but I think de facto is the right place to be. Um, I've carried on using this slide and I, I don't like it very much. Um, but I do at the same time, but for all the wrong reasons. Um, banking fraud now makes more money than drugs. Now, how you validate that, I have absolutely no idea. Um, but there is quite a lot of money in fraud right now. There is quite a lot of money in, in developing things the way we can attack organisations. Um, what I would say is there's quite a lot of money in the defence area as well. So, so if you have a choice, I think you should come on to the dark, onto the light side rather than move on the dark side. And if you think you can work on the dark side and then move across into a professional industry, that's going to be really difficult in the future. The Chinese are calling all over our corporate networks. So I think it's a really interesting statement. Um, if we try to do some of the intrusion analysis, generally we'll start to hit China reasonably quickly. If I was mounting an attack, um, I would go straight to China, bounce off my IP address through China, come back into some of the European states and attack that way. Because as soon as you go, you're just making these huge assumptions. What I think I'm saying here is that if you're going to work in this industry, don't take what other people say as being the norm or being true. Make sure you actually do your own investigation, make sure you have your own opinions, and you move the whole process forward so you understand exactly where you're coming from. I've got, um, as I say, I've got a couple of companies who are member companies in, in, in India. If you look at their um, threat reports, it's really interesting. You know, they, they say the vast majority of phishing attacks come from, comes from the States. Um, that's a different play. I've never ever seen that statement being made in the UK or the US. Um, and then again, if you look in Australia, you'll see that they've got a real dichotomy in terms of what they're trying to achieve because at the same time as, as you've got certain states moving in and supporting some of the mining organisations, uh, those are the people potentially they are also attacking to try to get the IPR and the contract material. So they've got this balance of trying to draw people into their, their marketplace and at the same time protect their IPR. It's a really interesting balance. Selling exploits is now a significant business. It is. If you go on the internet, you can type all sorts of things. You can do password crackers, you can do email uh, decompositions, you can uh, extract deleted emails, all the other stuff. There's loads of things you can do that you can download off the internet. Um, and if you develop those sorts of exploits, generally you can sell them. The reasonable price for those is around about $3,000 to $5,000 for a really good one. Um, you can make that in three days in the legitimate area of the business. You know, what you should do is to look at where the real money is. Yes, there are people making significant amounts of money doing things on the dark side, but there is this huge opportunity to do the right thing. And again, if you're looking for a career in this area, that's exactly what it is you should be doing. Selling identities is linked to that. So in other words, selling the identities is absolutely big business again, but protecting it is also extremely important. And that identity and access management, I think, is a really interesting research area. I don't see enough for the security of databases really at the moment. I'm really concerned about it. If we can actually get through the hardened shell, and quite often it's not a very hard shell, and actually get into the systems or into the backroom systems of the organisations, the first thing I would do is attack the database files. I'd absolutely go for the identity and access management database files because that would give me the rights across the whole organisation. It would also give me inference. So in other words, I can then do searches, I can actually analyse the information, and I can extract exactly what it is I want from mass data. So I don't think there's enough in there, and I think again on the penetration testing and intrusion analysis, there's an awful lot of research opportunities to move into that area. I see that as quite a big growth. And a significant move from accidental to deliberate. 
A few years ago when I used to do a lot more business continuity planning work than, than, than I ever do now, um, we were looking at this and really I was having trouble justifying why we needed all these technical controls in place. What we saw was fire, water damage, natural disaster and accidents as really making the, the vast majority of the incidents that had to be handled. That isn't true now. I can categorically say that a number of UK based organisations are under systematic attack and some of them don't even know it. Um, we're doing evaluations of organisations and some of the attacks we're seeing now go back five or six years. So in other words, they only just know it now, but they've been hemorrhaging information about their organisation's assets for five or six years. Quite a frightening place to be. So again, all I'm saying here is in this industry, turn everything on its head. Always look at things in a different way, and it's that analytical aspects that we really look for for individuals coming into this, this particular industry. So therefore, I think you can have a really good career in legal ethical security testing, uh, incident response, and some of the more technical areas. There's a big demand for people. What we have to do is to work out how we get you from academia into work. Uh, but once you're there, there's a really good career in this. It's very lucrative. It's a great fun place to be. I've been doing it for 35 years, and I'm enthusiastic about it now as I ever have been. Um, and it's a really great place to be with really good people. But what you've got to do is to think about the ethics side. When I used to take people on, you know, at the very least I used to Google their name and you'd be amazed what came out in, in terms of just doing that. I know when I started, the best they could do is speak to my bank, speak to somebody who knew me, which was a friend of my father's generally, and everybody said I was a really nice person. They made sure I wasn't bankrupt, made sure I didn't have any sort of, um, uh, I hadn't been arrested for anything recently. You know, I wasn't even arrested for anything. Um, right now, you can do a whole lot more. So in other words, if you really think that the employers in this particular area aren't going to do proper checks on you, then you know, you're, you're in another world, really. So what you've got to do right now is to think about your persona on the internet. You've got to think about what it is that you want to be portrayed as. And if you want to be portrayed as being somebody professional who wants to work in this industry and wants a proper career, that's the persona you've got to put onto the, uh, onto the, onto the web, if you like. And you've got to think about what it is you do and make sure you continue to do things in an ethical way that will structure that to allow you in. If we want to be considered as accountants and doctors, then what we can't be doing is, is doing things that are inappropriate for fraud and we can't do things like operations on the street. You know, those things are not acceptable anymore and they're not going to be acceptable in this area of the marketplace, I don't believe. And I think the rest of the industry is also going to go that route as well. Um, why did we set this up? Um, there's a number of reasons. There already was a scheme called CHEC, uh, which was the government's approach to, to looking at penetration testing. Um, they had a real problem in terms of keeping their examinations up to date, and I don't think they did an adequate job in terms of looking at the policies, processes and procedures of the companies. In addition to that, because it was working on national security related uh, initiatives, there was quite significant restrictions on using UK nationals and U using UK domiciled, domiciled uh, organisations. But if you wanted to set up a company, you could just do it. You could come out of here, or even not come out of here, and, and just go and buy yourself some scanning software and go and do 50 pence um, each on every IP address and run a scan against it. And you could describe yourself as a professional penetration testing company. I don't think you are. You could do poacher turn game people. So in other words, you could be doing things unethically and then you could be going into organisations saying, look what I managed to do um, or from the marginal dark side or grey areas. I don't think in the UK that's an appropriate practice. You still see some of that in the States, but even there I think that the tide is beginning to change. Um, I work with a, with a guy in the States who uh, did quite a lot on Wikipedia. Um, he has real trouble travelling. Every time he goes out of the States and tries to come back in, he has huge problems, you know. So please don't underestimate this, this concept that, you know, I'm really, I'm an uber person and everybody looks up at me because I've been on the dark side. That's not the way the industry looks at you anymore. Uh, irresponsible organisations. When I'm doing the audits, I'm amazed what I see. I, I see organisations with no indemnity insurance. I see organisations carrying insurance that isn't appropriate for penetration testing, yet that's the main part of their business. I see it with no policies and procedures for the protection of client-based information. No policies or procedures in place for the communication of client-based information, which may contain all the vulnerabilities of that organisation's whole infrastructure. Uh, just, just dreadful. 
And what we're trying to do is to make sure we look much more professional. We're trying to operate like a hospital with proper doctors in there, and therefore we need to look at those things. And an irresponsible organisation is, is a really difficult thing to get, because it could be cheap, but would you actually go there for an operation? And then opportunistic companies. So you can see an awful lot of opportunistic companies right now. Telecoms companies that really perceive there's a marketplace in security. We're seeing new seed money coming in from overseas because it's better to put seed money into a new opportunity than it is to try and leave it in the bank or do other forms of investment. Um, and again, startup organisations um, seed funded by, um, by a number of different sources, in, in, including sort of the, uh, the virtual environments. Uh, and again, what you've got to do is just consider what type of career you want, how you're going to address it, and then how you're going to attack exactly what it is you want out of it. Because right now is the time you should be doing some of that planning work. And what we're saying here is that Crest organisations provide a differentiator for testing organisations and their staff. And what we try to do is to provide a structured entry point for those aspiring organisations. So we work with those organisations that want to move into this area and we help them develop the policies and procedures. We help them to find the right insurances. We help them to understand how to protect client-based information. And, and that's what I think starts to make a, a profession and makes a professional organisation. Uh, it's quite interesting in the States right now, there's a big... Um, initiative that's just gone on which has lowered the bar quite a lot to sort of um, CEH or, or a GAC type qualification, we were talking about that earlier, um, as the entry point into the marketplace as, as a profession. And what I'm now seeing is the professional organisations, the real people that do this every day, the really be good people that are hot, are now trying to look for a differentiator against these sort of low start, low qualifications, low skilled type organisations. Um, the security testing industry was, was almost completely unregulated. Um, we could really do whatever we liked. Uh, it, it was dreadful. Uh, but as a Crest member company, you sign up to a memorandum of agreement and a code of conduct. Um, in addition to that, as I've mentioned, the individual also signs up to a code of conduct as they're taking the examinations. What that means is that if a customer has a complaint, then they come to Crest as, as an industry body and we do the investigation. So in other words, we can go in, we can use our professional judgment to see what's actually gone on. Quite often it's um, a problem with scoping. Um, the internet is all inv evasive and therefore what you actually get is a very difficult how you draw the lines around what it is you're actually doing the testing on. Um, you get over-enthusiastic penetration testers and naive clients. I think generally it's, it's those three categories. I've done seven investigations in six months. Um, that is to say that, that it's a massive problem, but it's really interesting. If you provide the instruments to actually do the measurement, and then you provide the instruments to actually allow people to complain, then things will come through. And ultimately, we feed all of that information back in to try to make the whole industry better. Um, we also tried a full arbitration service and again I think we save our members quite a lot of money sometimes because the investigations are much more structured and we really understand what's going on. So from a company membership perspective then these are the things that generally we're looking for. Uh, we're looking for them to ad ad agree and adhere to the memorandum of agreement which basically says you are actually adopting the policies and procedures that you've written. It's not a very difficult thing to do. You know, you've specified to me what it is that you say you're going to do to protect client-based information. If you don't, then you're doing something wrong. It's, it's not very difficult. Carry out appropriate vetting of staff. Again, coming back to that proper vetting of staff. All of the organisations we work with at least go to the ISO standard for, for individual vetting. Um, and where they don't, they have an equivalent set of policies and procedures in place themselves for doing that vetting of staff. You will not get into this industry without being vetted. Uh, you won't work in any of the other buying communities without being vetted. A demonstration of the quality, security and HR and audit processes. Again, what we're looking for there is to ensure that all of these things are in place to, to facilitate a good business structure. Have access to Crest accredited consultants and that can be through a contracted um, or through a full-time employment. The contracted side is quite interesting because it allows you to become a contractor and then work for a number of Crest organisations. Every time you do, you've got to look at your code of conduct against theirs and be aware of the policies, processes and procedures of the organisation. Carry out appropriate insurances and, and have your page or Crest membership. And then finally, have a methodology at least in line with, with the Crest minimum standards. We're not talking about OWASP standards here. What we're looking at is the organisation structure. And for penetration testing, we break that down into test administration, text execution and data security. What we're looking for is to make sure the scope aspects, I've already mentioned scope is, is generally quite a problem. 
um, one of the ones I've investigated recently, they got everything signed properly uh, to do a, a penetration testing of a web application. Um, they validated it, they got everything signed, they did the test, knocked over the website. The website didn't belong to the people they were contracting to, it was a third party relationship. You know, that's a difficult thing to identify. We fed that back in and, and hopefully there's some better policies and procedures. Legality, if you come across child pornography, you have a legal obligation to report. Uh, at the same time, I think you should do full disclosure and full reporting of all the vulnerabilities you find. So in other words, you can't hold things back for the next test you do, you should actually do full reporting and full disclosure. In terms of the execution then, what we're looking for is the overall approach. How do you approach your, your examinations uh, of, the, or of the organisation? What we do in terms of separation, so again, denial of service attacks on a live system that's running a payment system or is part of the critical national infrastructure, not a great idea, really. Um, so that separation is important, and it's linked to the tool heritage. I'm not saying don't use things in the wild that come from the internet. What I am saying is if you're going to use it, for goodness sake, separate it from the main systems, because they're, uh, they're very, very likely to have some form of an external payload. So in other words, you'll buy these things or you'll get them for free. Generally, there's something built into the code there's, uh, they're full of malware. Um, again, full traceability and repeatability aspects. And then finally, the data security side. What we're doing there is looking at the storage, transit, destruction of client-based information. This is very sensitive stuff and you need to treat it in a way that's going to be appropriate. You can see from here we have a slightly different approach, particularly in the middle section here, in terms of doing the intrusion analysis and the cyber incident response. But generally, we're looking for professional organisations that can demonstrate they understand how to operate in these environments, and they can do it in a professional way, and they employ professional people. Um, again, what we're coming up to here is the companies are audited for their processes, and they provide a positive contribution to the development of the industries and the individuals. Therefore, I think there's always a very good career. And if you're thinking about looking at these types of career opportunities, I would definitely use Crest as being your first board of call. Not the last one, but I'd definitely look down the list of organisations because those are the ones that have invested time and effort to actually try to get into these areas. I'm not saying don't go anywhere else, but I think that's a good starting place. And if you look at the sorts of things we have examined and, and look for in, in the organisations to which you might work, then try to make sure that you can actually get some mirror. So in other words, you have those sorts of things available to you in the organisations you're going to go and work for, particularly when you're early in your career. And, and this is why it's an exciting place to be. Um, there's actually a later version of this. This is a 2011 research. Um, but basically, what's happening here is you can see the number of people we need in the IT industry is going up. In actual fact, it's, it's done another hockey stick up the other way. And at the same time, the number of people going into some of the IT-related um, first degrees and even master's degrees is diminishing. It's got, again, a little bit of a kick coming up, but the gap is huge. And at the moment, what's happening is old people like me are filling those opportunities. And in 10 years' time, we're absolutely not going to be around. You know, my wife would kill me if she thought I was going to work for another 10 years. Um, I th still think I'll be working another 10 years' time, but I'll have to sneak out the door quietly and uh, get the patches off my elbows and my jacket. But, but I'm still enthusiastic about it. But we've got to get people interested in this and drag them in, because there is going to be a shortage. You might have a problem getting in, but once you're in there, it's going to be a good career, and it's going to be a career for a very long time. If I've managed to make a career out of this for 35 years, you're going to be much brighter than me, much better than me, and you're going to make a really good career of this. This is, what some, of, this is the, some of the other areas, and really I was just going to flick through this, but this is why it's so important. All of those aspects, if we're actually going to achieve any of those UK highlights in terms of moving our, our country forward, need to have good information assurance and IT security elements associated with it. And if we're going to increase productivity, we're going to increase efficiency, we're going to increase the way that we enact with, with the public and the way we do business to business communications, all of that is dependent on having a level of confidence and governance in place to allow it to happen. The first time that the VAT people get hit, I'm not going to do my VAT online. And then imagine how many post offices you have to reopen. I haven't retaxed my car for probably the last five years away from my desk. Imagine the queues going in to retax everybody's cars in post offices that now don't exist. 
and then you put that in the context of all the other things, you're doing a really important job if you come into this area because you're facilitating things and you're allowing those cultural changes to happen that allow the fruition of, of the organisations and the countries. There was virtually no professional qualifications in this area. I've mentioned things like CEH, um, probably about 100 to 120 hours you can go through and go and get them. If you look at CISSP through ISC squared, probably again around about 90 hours if you read the book quickly and you managed to get through it. Those, as far as I'm concerned, are indications that you're interested in the subject. Right? They're good indications, you know, so please don't think I'm suggesting don't do them, but you have to view them for what they are. But what we needed was was an industry-led set of recognised qualifications at the senior levels to, to actually draw people into the industry at the right level and then actually provide a career path. I would really like a two to two and a half thousand hour exam, which I haven't got at the moment. I'm working on trying to see what that might look like. Um, but at the moment, that, that entry point into the professional marketplace is around about six thousand hours. Sounds a lot, but there aren't too many other industries where you can go in and earn the sorts of salaries that you can on this with, with that type of um, investment of time. You have to work really hard. This is a challenging, interesting place to be, and it's very competitive. Crest provides that industry-led set of qualifications. It's a peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, the assessors who do the examinations on my behalf um, have to be, they have to provide, they have to pass the examinations first, then they have to provide CVs, then they have to go through a selection panel through the other assessors, then they have to supply um, research material, then they have to be shadowed, and that's all before they're allowed to do the adjudication of examinations. We take this stuff really seriously, and the people that are doing the examinations are the best in the industry. The CREST assessments, again, are therefore carried out to their peers, by your peers, to the very highest level. And therefore, what we're doing is trying to provide a really exciting career. The first time you try to sit our examinations, you will be seeing and sitting in front of the very best people in the industry. I was going to flick through these really quickly. Um, at this point, I would normally go into a little bit more detail, but I just thought I'd give you three quick examples of people that have come into the industry. Um, I'm going to provide a, a link through to some YouTube videos as well about a sort of day in the life of a penetration tester with, with a number of different people, but I just thought I'd flick through these because there's some interesting stuff, really. This is a gentleman who works for MWR. They're in Basingstoke, really good research firm. They spend a lot in terms of doing mobile, a lot in terms of doing penetration testing, and they're moving into the intrusion analysis and malware reverse engineering areas. But this individual here, really traditional, went to Southampton, became a software developer, and in 2009 became an information security consultant. Right? Very quickly he's gone in there and established what it is he wants to do, he's got some background in terms of the technologies, and then he started to apply it to the industry he wants to work in. He's gone into this because he's always at the forefront of technology, there's daily developments he has to keep up to date with, it's really technically challenging and staying one step ahead of the competition, which could be the people mounting an attacks, as well as your competitors, is a really interesting, challenging thing to do. He believes it's a growing importance in modern life, and you'll see the three people, they all say this. There is a cultural element to it, there is a, um, a, an aspect in terms of doing the right thing uh, associated with, with the people that work in this industry. And also this unique information sharing culture, where it's quite often the case that you're validating things you've found with your peers even quicker than you're validating with the organisations you work. So in other words, we're trying to build those informal communication structure into a more formal way. And again, hugely rewarding, he loves it. Um, this is his day in the life, I won't go through that, but basically there's some mundane stuff, some really interesting stuff in the middle, and then research you have to do at the back end of it. I'll give you all the slides. Um, his challenge is he sells time. We can't sell yesterday's newspaper. So, so as soon as you've sold that day, as soon as that day's gone, you can't resell it. You can't go back and resell it again. And therefore, the management of time in this stuff is really important. So don't underestimate the amount of work you have to do to get your assignments in on time, how you structure your work, how you structure your own personal research, because those are all life skills you're going to need if you're going to get into this area. Demonstration of excellent English and grammar skills. Please don't underestimate this. This is really important. I've got a number of CVs on my laptop at the moment that I'm trying to put out to some of the really best industry organisations, not just Crest or penetration testing, but the wider security industry. They are littered with spelling mistakes, grammatical problems, and all sorts of other things associated with it. That's not acceptable if you're going to be a professional in this area. You've got to work at this stuff. 
you know, what you're going to do is to do a huge amount of effort into your final dissertation. You've got to put the same level of effort into your CV and accompanying documentation. And therefore, those skills are really important to you moving forward. And that concept of being able to articulate an argument, so in other words, to take a technical issue and then explain it in a management term that is persuasive to allow people to do things is really important. Again, staying ahead of the curb, working in a dynamic team and travelling. Um, these are the reasons why I chose MWR, and there's all sorts of interesting stuff they do. They run their own conferences. And these are some of the research projects. And as you can see, he's quite a young man, yet all of these international um, uh, conferences are places he's been to and spoken at. You can get respect in a very early area in this, in this particular industry. And then these are some of the reading lists he suggested. And again, I'm trying to put those into a more structured way. Um, Christian is quite interesting. He now works for Verizon. So Verizon is one of the largest um, technology organisations in the world. Um, and this is where he came from, uh, University of Argentina. Um, started to be a junior penetration tester in 2002, and in 2010 he became a practice leader. Uh, again, you can see that is quite a fast progression through that, that particular area. And again, a team leader is quite a senior person in this particular industry. And a practice leader in one of the leading organi technical organisations in the world is quite an achievement, really. Um, again, studied in Buenos Aires, moved into the security world after working for the United Nations, um, and then moved to Spain. Started his own greyish area of the industry, but then quickly realised that wasn't the right area to go into and he needs to move across. So again, hack lags and fist were, were areas that he actually started up, but then he moved into the mainstream. Um, and again, 2005, joined the biggest security company in the world. Um, basically, what we're suggesting there is that he has to read an awful lot of information. Staying up to date is a really relevant part of this keeps up to date in terms of his toolkit, learns the latest techniques, works on engagement, writes report, delivers results. And again, his best experience in working with really bright people, being part of the penetration testing community, that word community's come out again, and then live demos is that explanation, and then being told that something is possible is the challenge side of things, then each project is different, he wants to push his skills even at the level he's at now, are sort of common things that come out of everybody I speak to in this particular area. Uh, Jonathan's quite interesting. Um, I left some of his words and his slides in here. Didn't do very well at school and then blagged his way as he describes it into university. Um, he then did really well uh, at university. Again, network security. Became a Crest uh, CRT extremely quickly and then got his master's degree from Royal Holloway around about the same time. So he was studying as well as doing the work. Um, he worked for a small company called Advisor, um, which was then taken over. Um, and again, you can see when he first started, the vast majority of it was on systems administration and then gradually moving into security analysis and then penetration testing. Um, don't be afraid to go in at these bottom levels. You can get out of them really quickly, but to understand what's going on and to understand the sorts of technology issues people have got is, is really invaluable. If you're going to go into web testing, again, go into coding. You know, work out what it is you're actually going to protect in the future. Otherwise, you can't test it. Um, these are some of the other areas he works. And, and bearing in mind, his UCAS score would have been awful. Um, his master's degree is in an odd sort of networking security type thing. Um, he now works for a big four. So in other words, he's gone in as an experienced hire, although he's still quite a young man. Um, and he's working in their professional services and, and he's doing proper work in terms of a big four organisation and he's on that career path within that. If he'd have tried to get in straight from university or other places, he wouldn't have been able to do it. But again, you can see that somebody there has got a challenge. They've pulled their soles up from their bootstraps, they've worked really hard with a direction and a focus, and they've done really well. Again, some of the things he doesn't like, you'll break something, it's really hard. Monotony is terms of just general stuff you find everywhere. Uh, but it's hard at the same time, because what you're doing is challenging yourself uh, to be best. Competitive, lots of one-upmanship, both in terms of the very nature of what you do. And then frustrating, because sometimes there really isn't anything interesting there to find. And you'll find that more in the malware and the intrusion analysis, even more than the pen testing. Um, the best bits, he thinks, is an awesome chat of line, um, which I think is really funny. I, as I've hinted out, I used to be a civil servant, so if that didn't turn anybody off, I then used to say I worked in IT, that would definitely get rid of people. Then if it didn't, I used to say I was working in technical security and absolutely nobody would speak to me at all. So, so I had to do other things to make my life more interesting to, to actually get married and have kids. Um, but now, 
it's quite a good thing. You know, you see films about them, you know, immediately they've all got long hairs and t-shirts and they work in a darkened room in a basement and they do things that you can't actually do. But at least, you know, we're beginning to get some exposure so people have some idea what this industry is all about. And the fact we have got a personality, the fact we are funny, the fact we do try to move things forward is, is just a fabulous thing. Continuous learning, varied, problem solving, good prospects. You get paid to break stuff and helping people in the companies comes out, again, as one of those cultural things. As I say, spend a bit of time. Go on to the day in the life stuff when I give it to you. And, 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 and hopefully when you go into the industry, come and give me some back because then we can encourage more people in. So the opportunity is to look at these professional-led industry qualifications and actually orientate your, your career path around a professional development and around a, an a set of organisations and structures and examinations that will allow demonstrability of your capability. Right? This is the way the industry is going. It's not just pen testing that's moving in this area. If you look at the whole of CCP, which is a CESG Certified Professional Scheme, that's looking at examinations and assessments across the piece in terms of all of the information security roles. This is the direction you're going to go, and it doesn't matter whether or not you're going to technical or non-technical, you've got to plan your career. You've got to think about where you're going to go. You've got to think how to get in and ultimately where you want to go. And then orientate all your activities and all your efforts to achieve that. That's the, by far the best thing to do. And to be enthusiastic and driven are all the things that the industry is looking for. In terms of our qualifications then, as you can see, again from the background of some of the people I mentioned, you've got the network administrators, academia or applications development. After two years regular and frequent experience, you can look to do one of our registered examinations. And again, it's common across the whole piece. So intrusion analysis, cyber incident response, malware reverse engineering, penetration testing, we're all looking for that around about two years worth of regular and frequent experience. And then you start to specialise. So expect the people at the registered level to have a good understanding of infrastructure or apps, but to understand both areas. There's also mobile in there as well, and there's some other aspects in terms of things like SCADA systems. Um, but at that point, you become a generalist, and then you start to specialise. And the way we specialise in the penetration testing area is through infrastructure and applications. And again, we're looking at five years plus worth of experience. It's really interesting when some people come into this industry thinking they're really good and then they go up against the real professionals, it, it's a real eye-opener. Cybersecurity challenge, which I really like, I'll mention it again a bit later. Um, they were trying to do some, uh, if you like, challenge the experts. It, it was just such an uh, unbalanced uh, attack defence um, aspect that, that we just intermixed everybody together because we wanted to make sure that everybody derived the best benefit. This stuff is hard and the people that do it well are really good at it. What we do is we have multiple choice, long form, practical, multiple choice for looking at knowledge, uh, long form for looking at skill and application, and then a practical application is, is if you like, looking at the um, uh, performance aspects of, of your competence. And, th and that's the way we do all of our examinations. On the network forensic side, really it's quite interesting. Um, I don't well, I like the word network very much, and I don't like the word forensics. However, that's where the money is at the moment in terms of trying to get people into the industry, so I use it. In this one, I'm actually talking about is malware, intrusion analysis, and then re-engineering. Um, and again, what we're seeing there is an increasing number of companies are under, uh, under quite consistent attack. That's why we're getting so much research in, in this particular area. And, and it is consistent, it is persistent, and it is quite hostile, I think would be the words I'd use. Tackling these attacks in, include the development of the ability to detect them as they're happening, but also to look at the intrusions to find out where they've gone. Detections are based around the concept of network forensics, although it's not real forensics. It's not very often you actually go to a prosecution, but you need to understand how to gather certain things in a forensic sound manner. And relatively few companies provide the commercial products. And again, no way of establishing competence, and therefore there's loads of people coming into the industry who really had no qualifications and no abilities. And therefore, as with penetration testing, the CPNI, and this is the Cabinet Office, uh, it's the area of the Cabinet Office that is responsible for all of the critical national infrastructure aspects of the UK, um, actually helped us to fund some of the development of examinations in this area. And the government is looking to develop schemes associated with the company membership and the qualifications around it. Um, the competencies are network intrusion, host based intrusion, and malware reverse engineering. I wanted to get those two intrusion bits in one examination. I don't want to run too many exams. 
um, but they were quite different in terms of the, the types of skill and knowledge needed. And therefore what we're looking for here is people to find evidence of malware in larger network traffic and then identify malware um, and take forensically sound copies of the relevant code. And the difference between those is it's extremely difficult on the network side to actually gather information in a forensically sound manner. I, I challenge people to try to do it and then put it to the courts. And then the reverse engineering is to actually find out the cause routes and then try to find out how you can fix things um, after finding malware attacks. And again, this is the way we do the examinations. We're looking for skill, knowledge and competence. And, and what we're doing is trying to apply those standards across the piece. As I mentioned before, we've also got security architecture, which I'll come on to in a minute. Uh, again, a very similar approach. From an international basis, then we have really close relationships with the UK government. As I say, we run all of the examinations for, for the Czech scheme, the vast majority of them. Um, and we're working with the government to establish the new schemes in terms of how we move those processes forward. Um, this is just a little bit of background about Czech. So again, if you want to work for the UK government in this area, then you'll look for Czech organisations. So in other words, those companies have got UK domiciled um, organisations and you have to be a UK national. So in other words, you have to pass the UK security requirements to work in certain areas. But it's a real partnership. This is probably the first time I've ever seen a real partnership between industry and government in this way, where we have dual recognition and we work together so closely to actually deliver what I think is an important thing. Um, and this was the process. So we've actually gone through from taking over the examinations to developing new to actually trying to influence what the industry looks like. And again, working together on that is again something I really haven't seen. This is really fascinating stuff. And exactly the same thing was trying to happen in the States. So there was something called the National Bureau of Information Security Examiners. And, um, and that was funded from a number of different sources. And some of the evaluations and the assessments there were, were quite interesting. Uh, this was the board of NBIS. And, uh, and they had a very common aim. Uh, the difficulty they had was that the number of people they put through the examinations didn't have... 6,000 hours. They had a lot less than that and they were meant to be competent but they couldn't pass the exams. Well I could look at the CVs and say you know at the time when they were just getting good they'd be moved out onto something else and therefore they're not going to be able to pass these types of exams. So again we're now trying to backfill to actually put some proper structure in here and it's the supply industry which is now driving those initiatives interesting enough. Australasia is really interesting. You've got the Attorney General's office and you've also got industry and you've got the PM's office. Again, those organisations um, help pay to establish a Crest chapter in Australia for, for around about six months and they took all of our rigs out there. We run everything IPR free. Um, and therefore you can go and get qualified over there and work for a Crest member company. Um, it's really interesting how that particular side of things is growing and again they have quite close associations with Asia and also New Zealand. And, and that's really the first, what well, I would say, grown up proper um, international coverage for, for a Crest organisation. Um, but we also, what I've said, we also have affiliations with other companies in other countries and we've been driven to, to supply more and more, although we're very small. But our level of influ influence, I think, is increasing quite dramatically. So just to give you an idea, um, starting when you come into the industry, um, I think you'd be aiming for 20 to 25. If you're looking at an internship, it's the equivalent of around about 14 to 18,000 pounds a year pro rata over the period in which you're working. As you enter into there, 20 to 25 is a, a relatively easy salary, I think, to try to get. 6,000 hours later, and, uh, and bearing in mind if you work really hard, you can circumvent some of that because of the research you will have done as part of your degree course. You'll be looking at somewhere between 35 to 55,000 pounds a year. Uh, the 35 is, is normally a repayment back um, because somebody's put an awful lot of investment in you to get you up to that level of the organisation and they'll keep your salary slightly low for a little period of time where they're trying to recoup some of the training money. I'd never ever see an open marketplace for 35 for a registered tester or intrusion analysis person. It's much more closely to the 50s. It's, it's got to be 50 really. Um, 10,000 hours later, you'll be looking at 60 to 90,000 pounds as a specialist person doing something that's really exciting. And at that point, it's the choice is yours. You can then go on to team leadership. That's generally what you can earn working for yourself, if you like. So in other words, you're generating the work, you're generating things within the organisation, and that's the payback to the company. 
If you then start to develop teams underneath you, then again the salary expectation in those areas can be significantly more than that. And for certain organisations right now, they're paying more to get people in to, to run those and develop those particular parts of the industry. It's a really good place to work. So you imagine five years in, after doing a bit of work, um, so in other words, maybe 18 months or a year trying to get your foot on the ladder, and then doing five years, you're, you're earning almost £100,000 a year. It's a really good industry to be in. It's really exciting, really challenging. And if you just want to stay in the technology, you can continue to work in, work in boutique organisations, or you can just stay in that particular area and make yourself a very good living. Um, I'll just cover one of the other schemes very quickly. So this is, I've mentioned before, is a CESG certified professional scheme. There are three certifying bodies. There's the British Computer Society, there's the Association of Project Managers Group Limited, the people that do the print training, and there's a consortia between uh, Royal Holloway College, which was um, for the academia, which we haven't used yet, um, and the ISSP, the inf Information Information Security Professional, Institute of Information Security Professionals, and CREST as, as a consortia. And what CREST does is we provide the technical examinations in those areas, and the ISSP provide the structure in terms of the interview process, which I think works really well. I think we're the hardest uh, by quite a long way, actually. Um, and basically, that's the way that particular thing is structured. So again, they're looking at competency-based assessments, and we're looking at the technical examinations. Again, this is where the industry is going in all areas of information assurance. And what we're looking at is these are the, these are the roles that are currently defined. Uh, and, and the government is working to define other roles. And you've got organisations like BP, BT and others that are beginning to structure their whole system in, in alignment with the way we're doing the scoring under the ISSP skills, skills framework and the way we're doing these assessments. We have three levels, practitioner, senior practitioner and lead. Lead is really difficult to get. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get more money. The senior practitioner, is, I think, is slightly overcrowded, and the practitioner, at the moment, I think, is a little bit too easy to get into. But again, this is the structure in terms of how things can be done in the future. And then from a Crest perspective, what we do is we provide the security architecture examinations, and again, around about 6,000 hours. So we expect people to pass that examination, which is really hard. We've had some really good comments from people that are purported to be security architects that have said, well, this is quite technical, and we're going, yeah, there's no big surprise there. You know, We don't think that a network architect draws a little terminal and then a fluffy cloud and then something that looks like a bucket on the end and then calls that a network. We actually want somebody who understands the protocols and can design this stuff and do it properly from a security perspective. So. We are driving that technical agenda in those areas, and I'm seeing more and more of the technical requirements coming out. Again, database, again, SCADA, and again, some of the other areas. I really think we need to have professional level qualifications in these. Um, and that allows you access into something called CLASS, the CESG Listed Security Advisor Scheme. And again, that's a partnership. There's around about 800 CLASS consultants at the moment, and they're all going through a transitional process through the CCP scheme to get their skills and competence assessed. Uh, again, you can see here there is a big trend in exactly what I'm saying in terms of the structure and the way that you're going to have to demonstrate your capability in the future. And this is the way it works. Um, again, you've got risk advisor, accreditors, architects and auditors. And what I would have liked to have seen was the overall risk advisor as being the entry point and then some breakout points. Um, that's not quite how it is at the moment. But I think what you need to do is to decide what area you want to go into. And if you want to talk to me about the types of examinations, the types of structures, where you should go to get advice, and the sorts of areas you should, you should consider, phone me. You'll have my telephone number at the end. You'll have my email address. I assure you, because of the numbers here, I'll personally respond to all of you. Um, but anybody else who's, who's looking at this, you know, I will absolutely respond. It may take me a little bit of time, but I will respond to every single email or request for information I get. And then what we're doing here is to try and provide this, this clear standards and opportunities to share and enhance knowledge. We're working on standards, we're working with training companies to allow that career path to be more structured in terms of helping people to identify their skill gaps uh, and knowledge gaps, not competence gaps. Um, and then to try to put them into the right areas of research and the right training courses to try to move them from academia into the profession. We're doing our industry conference where we talk about real technical issues. 
we're working, we've got working groups with collaborative organisations. I had 30 people uh, last week at a, at a working group within British Telecom um, from the government, from industry, particularly finance, and then from the supply industry, all talking about cyber incident response and what this, what this is and how we as an industry should respond to it properly. These working groups are really good. Um, we provide white papers, I need a lot more of those, and then again the UK Security Challenge, we're trying to identify talent and use more people in it. Our vision, as I've said, is to offer a demonstrable level of assurance that processes the member organisations and extend that. I do think that we need to grow up in terms of our profession and the organisations that are providing services in this area need to demonstrate that they're actually committed to this and demonstrate they actually work in this area and they want to do it in a professional way. We want to be able to validate the competence of information security testers and more generally the information technology people. We want to provide us guidance and opportunities to share and enhance knowledge wherever we can. We want to provide additional information to the recognised professional standards and we also want to support people with their ongoing personal and professional development. Just to close on this, then, I think the current uh, CISOs of this world aren't technically competent enough to be able to be in the post even. And, and I have to be careful how I say that, but, but in many instances I believe that to be true. And many of the existing C, uh, CISOs don't have enough technical capability to do it. But I think the future will have to come from deep dive technical people. If you don't understand the technology, how on earth can you set the strategy and achieve all of those savings that we had up the front without understanding what the risks are, mitigate those risks to an appropriate level, do the risk management because you're going to accept some level of risk and then be able to identify what's going on and not have the wall pulled over your eyes. This is where this is going to come from. This is a slide from PwC and, and they're even talking about this concept of a cyber CEO. But really what they're saying is that all of these areas of the board, because that would normally make up the board, have to have some understanding of technology. And I think it's incumbent on you to actually drive it forward. So in other words, to be able to demonstrate that you can do these things in an appropriate fashion and be able to demonstrate that you've got the managerial skills. So again, that argument, um, being able to articulate an argument, being able to write things down properly and to be able to understand business is really important to you because I think there's an opportunity if you really want it to go up to the senior levels in this area. So in summary, I think you're in a really good place. Um, this is a huge opportunity. It's not going to be easy to get in. So please don't think you just walk out, everybody's going to give you a job. That, that isn't the way things work. You've got to work. You've got to be able to demonstrate you've done things. You've got to work outside of the curriculum to demonstrate how interested you are. You need to address everything you do to make yourself as interesting as you possibly can. If you're going to write your CV on one page or two pages, you've got to think about some really interesting things that are going to differentiate you from the crowd. And if you don't do that, you're not going to achieve. There are significant opportunities once you get in. You know, it's a really good place to work. You'll progress quickly, but you'll have to work really hard. And there continues to be a market demand, and I think that market demand is only going to grow. I think maybe the infrastructure testing may change its nature a little bit over time, um, but I think that's going to that's going to change. But it's still going to be there. And and the market demand for for web applications testing is is significant. And I think the significant uh, requirements for cybersecurity incident response in all of its forms is going to increase really dramatically very quickly. It's a really open community. You know, we want to accept a range of different people with different views. We want them to have professional, hard-working ethics, though. So, in other words, we do want you to be different. We do want you to come in with your own ideas, your own perceptions. But what we want you to do is to work within the confines of a professional organisation. And therefore, professionalisation and the professional qualifications, I think, are the future. And you should be orientating your career around what it is you want to get out of it and the direction you want to go. And there are also significant international opportunities. We are really good at this in this country. That's why lots of people come and study here. That's why lots of people want to place their industries here. And that's why this particular part of the industry is really growing. But if you want to take that and go and work in Australia, New Zealand, Asia, Africa, I can assure you there are huge opportunities for you to go. Um, just a couple of things. Cybersecurity Challenge. I think if you're a student, you should look up and participate. Uh, I think the person who won this year, I was on the prize committee and we, I think we allocated around about £28,000 worth of training and development opportunities. And I think the average was around about two to £3,000. So, 
it's a really good thing to tuck in, tuck in your back pocket and it also gives you an idea of whether or not you're actually cut out for this type of stuff. I'm not saying it's completely demonstrable of what a career looks like in this area, but have a go at it, you know, over the summer period, again you can put it on your CV if you get to some of the more, um, uh, more advanced areas in terms of the competitions. Um, and then contact me. Um, sign up to the Crest Student Membership. I'll be right honest, it's not a great deal I'm going to give you right now. So I'm going to build that over time, but at least I'll get your contact details and I promise I'll send you newsletters, I'll promise I'll keep you up to date with things, and you will be part of an infrastructure where we'll start to develop and do more exciting things. But we're not just that. We're also looking to organise international conferences based on our material provided through our conferences, and we've called that CrestX, that Crest Information Exchange. And again, I'd like to talk to your university more about doing that. We supply all of the material, so in other words, a summary of the, the professional uh, presentations and then the detail behind the professional presentations. We'll help you organise to run your own internal conference, and all we ask you to do is just film some of the, the presentations you make and then put them back in the centre so there's much more of information sharing. And if you get any other good ideas about how we can share information, come and talk to me. We're completely open and we're really enthusiastic about doing things in a different way that are grown up. If you want an internship, give me a CV and a covering letter. Um, if you're really interested in doing a summer placement right now, on your way home, send me a CV. Uh, because as, as I mentioned before, I'm working with Biz and IAC in terms of putting together an awful lot of CVs to go into some really interesting companies, not just in the service sector, but in the finance, telecoms, uh, the big four, um, some of the software providers and some of the security product people. There's, there's some really interesting opportunities there. And it's around about six to eight weeks over the summer. If you don't want to do it this year, think about it for next year. Make sure you put your CV in, make sure you ask for things, because it isn't just that summer vacation type thing. You could do an internship at the end of your degree course. You can do it if you've got a gap in the middle. You can do it to supplement some of the things you also have to do to, to demonstrate what it is you've done in your degree course as well. So speak to me. I'll always do my best to try and place you, particularly if you're enthusiastic, and particularly if you take the time to put that covering letter around the CV describing why it is you want to work in this industry. If you can't articulate that, you know, then you've got some real problems. Job opportunities, I will help you try to get into the industry. So in other words, that first career step is where I'm interested. Once you've got into, into the industry, then you can look after yourself. Right? But I will do everything I can to encourage people to take new entrants into the industry and provide them in a structured development path. If you need any training advice at any time in your career, speak to me. And if you want any careers advice, including how you want to set up your own little boutique, then, then talk to me as well. You know, I'm hoping that this is the start of a dialogue, not the close of a dialogue. I hope I'm standing in front of you as, as somebody that I hope you will have a relationship with in the future and we'll do our very best to try to support you throughout what you do. And that's it. All I'm saying here, I think it's a fabulous place to work. I think we've tried to professionalise the industry. I think we're doing quite a good job of that. I think we can do a better job. And I think working collaboratively with industry, with the supply industry, with academia and government, I actually think we can make a real difference. And, and I hope that you will come along the journey with me. So, thank you very much. <laughs>